We're really delighted today to have Marvin Odom here, who's the president of Shell Oil Company in Houston, Texas. Um, uh, Marvin has been in uh, the oil business for a long time. He started as an engineer with Shell in 1982, and he served in a number of management positions at a variety of different levels throughout the company, um, uh, both technical and commercial aspects of energy um, of their business. Um, but in particular, he has, a, has an unusual distinction he was just telling me about. He's really the first l leader of the American <coughs> Shell Group to actually sit on the uh, executive committee in The Hague, first sort of American to be trusted with the European wow. uh, leadership of the company. <laughs> um, he has a very interesting perspective in that regard because of Shell's, Shell's global um, impact on, on the future of energy, the topic of, of this series. So please join me in welcoming Marvin Odom to Harvard. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a, uh, really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation to, to come and talk to you. And I thought what I'd do is I would just, I didn't bring any pictures, so unfortunately no interesting slides, just going to be me talking. Um, but what I wanted to do is just outline a few remarks, give you some of at least my perspective on the topic, the future of energy, but then hopefully turn this into more of a question and answer discussion where you can actually frame which direction this goes by the, uh, the questions you ask. Now, future of energy is a pretty broad, ambitious topic, it seems like to me. You could come at it from a lot of different angles. Um, I'm going to do just what you would expect I would do, which is by my nature of who I am and what I do, I'm going to come at it from the point of view of what drives us as a company to a degree, what drives us as, as an industry, and uh, certainly what drives our strategy as we put that together. Um, on that point, I'm perfectly willing to be very open about the strategy of the company and where we're trying to go, where we focus our capacity. We're one of the largest energy companies in the world. We invest about $30 billion a year. That has multi-decade implications each year for us and uh, in, to, in, a, in a number of degrees to people other than just us. Uh, but I'll also tell you that that strategy and, and how we focus our, our investments is somewhat of a, a dynamic process, meaning you know, we're in a learning mode here and, and we adjust as we learn things that are critical to that business going forward. It's obviously a very rapidly changing world. And so you know, my hope, again, is I'll walk away with a couple of new points of view from you all today that, uh, that will help me with that, and I'm sure that you won't hold back. Now, I did actually expect to be walking into this room today, having come from Washington, D.C., having just rolled out a new energy and climate bill sponsored by Cary Graham and Lieberman. So that was my intent. That's what I was going to talk about. That's the, how I structured several things that I said I was excited about if you saw a title for this lecture. And that obviously didn't happen. So it doesn't mean that uh, it squelches my optimism that it can and still will and at the right time will happen. And I hope that's sooner rather than later. But it does change a bit the, uh, the orientation of the talk. So some, some similarities, but uh, certainly some things are at least on a bit of a delay there. Now, I'd, I'd want to start, again, going back to the, the strategy and what helps us make the decisions that we make. I wanted to start by just sharing a few core beliefs that we have and I have about the future that really do have that, that shaping force on us. And if, if you followed anything about you know, what I've said or what we've said as a company, you'll recognize some of these. So I'm not going to spend much time on them because they've, they've been in place for at least several years now. And the first of those is a belief that the global demand for energy is going to continue to grow, might even use the word surge, with the growth, growth in popula population and industrialization around the world. And this is all tied back to the predictions around, you know, middle of the century, nine billion people, two more Chinas than there are today in terms of number of people. Um, and the fact that that could, doesn't mean it has to, but it could on reasonable projections with efficiencies built in and everything else, it could result in humans consuming twice the amount of energy that they do in the world today. So that's a, uh, that's a shaping, shaping projection at, uh, at the very least. The second one is an expectation that there'll be greater energy price volatility and supply tightness as we go forward. And again, it, it's tied back to the first one, but it basically says to a degree, supply is gonna have a hard time keeping up with that type of demand growth and it takes us to the natural conclusion 
then that all forms of energy are going to be important, whether that's renewables, more challenging oil and gas in some cases, nuclear, and so forth. Now, the third shaping force for us is that environmental stresses from all of this energy will continue to increase. And the response and the pressure to do something about that will continue to increase. And we see that as triggering a patchwork of national and regional government response, which we think will have the effect of speeding up the development of cleaner energy technologies. Now today, if you look at this, I say those have been in place for a while, we look at that today and say, yeah, those are still valid, still shaping the direction we're going. There are a couple of, you know, slight modifiers I would put on that, given where we stand today. And the first one is that the supply tightness, if you will, on the supply demand picture for energy globally has certainly been delayed, and that's the result of the economic recession that, that the world's been going to. So it changes that picture, certainly in the short term, may actually be some permanent shift in the, in the rate of growth of demand. Doesn't change necessarily the long-term picture in the way we see it. Um, the second one is this, this very fast ramp up of gas supplies in North America, the unconventional gas supplies, is potentially a significant change in, in the way you look at energy going forward. And the fact that that could be repeated then in other key countries around the world like China and potentially others means the gas supply, the natural gas supply around the world could actually be considerably better than what we had previously estimated. Um, and to the point of governments then taking action around environmental issues and otherwise, I would actually stand here today and say we think the expectation that that's going to be pushed harder and faster is even greater, despite the fact that I'm sitting here the day after something I expected to happen and it didn't happen. But that's the way we, we look at the world. Okay, so the leading questions on the, the future of energy as we try to plan a strategy, strategy around that is how do we transition the economy to lower energy intensity, first of all, capturing all the efficiency angles of that, and then also change, changing the energy system from a high carbon to a low carbon emission set. Now, in projecting the result of that change, this is something else that, that's been out there for a while from us, is we can see that by the middle of this century, about 30% of that total energy supply could come from rene renewable and alternative energies. Now remember, this is the, the same person that was saying a little while ago that the total demand from the world could be twice what it is today. So twice the demand and 30% of that bigger number then being filled by wind, solar, other renewables. Um, along with, of course, the, the whole system being more efficient. And also with a variety of transportation fuels, none of which will surprise you. Electricity, biofuels, and, uh, and potentially hydrogen. But the other side of that story is pretty striking as well, and particularly for, for an oil and gas company. And that is, where's the remaining energy going to come from? And, you know, until there is some significant breakthrough that I haven't thought of yet, or at least the, the people working for us haven't thought of yet, is where is that, you know, what, what will fill that gap? And fossil fuels certainly appear to still be an item that's going to be needed to fill that gap. And, of course, then the issue goes to how do you do that in the, the lowest impact way possible. Um, now, everybody in this room understands this, I'm sure, but of course the scale of the energy system is absolutely enormous. And, that, and that, this is the important point when it comes to thinking about how do you shift it and how do you change it. And it makes change, I think, to a degree correspondingly slow. Now, speaking of slow, we did a little bit of research, not scientific. You know, everybody in this room could probably come up with better numbers, but we looked at the last century looked at all the new energy components that had come into play. And what we found in looking at that is almost two, two a, an energy piece, particularly with new energies, cross-border view as well. It took about 30 years for any new, new energy system to grow to 1% of the market, which again, just gives you a sense of the time scales involved in making these shifts. Um, so a couple of examples of that, biofuels is one that comes to mind. Just now getting to about 1% of the oil market. Wind potentially could represent 1% by the middle of this, uh, this decade. LNG, liquefied natural gas, it was the same story. And so, you know, we ask ourselves as we look at about, you know, what's going to cause things to shift and how do you shift over time, you know, what's the, we think we understand, but what's the rationale behind that, uh, that, that statement of 30 years? And of course, what we find is once you find a technology that works, 
or at least appears it will work. Then it takes several years to really get it designed up and running and get a demonstration plant going. And then we typically spend another couple of years operating it, ref you know, re optimizing it, refining it to the point where you've got enough confidence to invest billions of dollars into a commercial scale scale up. So getting to a commercial scale up from the initiation of a new technology can actually fairly easily be 10 years. And then if you think about taking that first scale up and doing a dozen more, it can be another 10 years before you have that. And you start to get this sense of how long and how much investment is required to, to impact this entire system. And of course, in parallel with any of those changes, the assumptions made that, that you're able to build the human capacity and the industrial capacity it takes to get it done, and that you get the societal and the political acceptance and support as you go through it. So we looked at that and we said, okay, that's, you know, that's interesting. It's not a natural law. It's more of a societal, societal law, if you will. Um, and there's really no reason why we shouldn't be focused on how do you, how do you change that going forward. Um, how do you accelerate those learning curves and the development? And certainly a big part of that is getting the right kind of support from, from government policy. So if I go back to this prediction of 30% of renewable alternative energies, or those energies filling 30% of this total energy supply by the middle of the next cent by the middle of this century, that's a complete <coughs> blow away of the third, this sort of 30 year pattern that I talked about before. And part of the reason that we project it that way is that it's based on a, an assumption that there are significant carbon pricing and trading systems in place. If that's not in place, then I think that projection of 30% is out the window, and, and history certainly tells me that. Um, without the development of several very large carbon markets, it's difficult for us to see how you're going to attract, again, no surprise, attract the private capital that's needed into uh, to emission reduction projects. And it's unlikely that public financing is going to make up that difference, of course, particularly as you go to repetitive scale-up kind of situations. Now, CCS, carbon capture and, and storage, just as a mitigation technology is, I think, a, a fair example of this, at least. And even if the, the public sector funded 100% of the capital infusion you need to put a, a carbon capture and storage in place, it's still difficult to see how you're going to get private companies, private capital to even spend the operating cost it takes to run a project like that without some type of carbon price incentive to uh, to provide an offset. Now, you know, all that said, this is a little more company specific, but all that said, it doesn't mean we're just sitting on the sidelines and, you know, watching and waiting to see what happens. So I'll stick with CCS for just a minute. We're, we're pursuing a project now, Dan and I were talking about this on the way over, it's called Quest. This is associated with a fairly controversial set of uh, hydrocarbon development called the oil sands in Canada. Um, this is a project that the government of Alberta and the government of Canada have chosen to put $800 million into. Just this one, one project starts to, again, give it a sense of scale. And the end result of this project, what it would, it was that it would capture and sequester about a million tons per annum of CO2. And that's about 25% of the total CO2 emitted from this, uh, this oil sands operation that we have. Now, you can, you can see the strength of the government support in that they're willing to put $800 million behind it. They, of course, control the regulations and other factors, so plenty of push there. Going as fast as we can, we think the earliest we can be injecting CO2 is 2015. And, and I go through all that just, again, to point to some of the timescales that, uh, that we're looking at. And that assumes, actually, that the regulatory piece and the public acceptance piece actually works out as we, as we move forward with the project. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, while there's when there's no carbon price to provide the incentives of a company to act unilaterally, we are, in our internal view of economics, applying a carbon price. So again, company specific. And, and we've now, for the first time, and we've been doing this for about 10 years now, but we've just now started to talk more publicly about what carbon price we use, because we've always considered that proprietary information before. But what we do is we apply, we apply an internal burden of $40 a ton of CO2 on any project that, uh, that we look at going forward. Now, granted, in a world where CO2 prices make believe, not something real, and what that, what that does is it allows us to understand as a, as a project goes forward then how sensitive is it 
to carbon mechanisms and carbon pricing. And then the, one of the more interesting things we found is it starts to change the way people design and implement projects. As you think about emissions, you start to think about efficiency, you start to define, to design things differently. And we see plants going up now in our own business that, have, that are ready-made for carbon separation and capture, and then to take the next step is effectively a bolt-on, not a complete refit of the facility. So it is having positive impacts in, uh, in that way. So let me come back to a little bit more about, you know, my, my perception of where energy is going. Now, I don't obviously speak for the whole oil and gas industry, but I think this sector has two or three actually important roles to play. The first really is making more energy available. I'll come back to, to each one of these. Um, the second is increasing the efficiency of our own operations, and the third is increasing the share of low carbon energy. So on the first, making more energy. Yeah, to, to us what that means is continuing to push the envelope in terms of technology that allows us to, to access, in this case, fossil fuels primarily, um, that are safe that, and that are affordable. And, and this truly is things like deep water production, it's unconventional natural gas, it's Arctic to a degree. So there are a lot of things that cause a lot of concerns to a lot of people, but Focusing on that technology and making that safe and affordable is a big part of what we do, and we think resources that the world is actually going to need. Um, the, the technology in this industry, again, I don't want to presume kind of who's seen it and who hasn't, but I, I just came in last week, I think it was Thursday probably, I was out in the Gulf of Mexico with this horrible disaster happening, you know, just a few hundred miles from where I was. But just, and we can come back to that, maybe come back to that in the question period, but went out to our facility, which is literally 200 miles offshore. It's in the, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in 8,000 feet of water. You can imagine just the, the mid ocean dynamics of designing a project that can exist in that sort of environment. And then imagining it, having to build it in a way that it can withstand hurricanes and other extreme forces. And it produces, you know, oil from 8,000 feet of water and then tens of thousands of feet down in the ground below that, brings it to the surface, pipelines it, um, refines it, puts it through a retail system and puts it into a car at a top couple of dollars a gallon. And, and my point is that the technology involved in doing that is fascinating if you've never seen it. And, I, it, 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 you know, it may be something that you want to, uh, to look into. Now, I get a lot of... Uh, one of the challenges I get a lot is if that technology is so good and we have people that are that creative and can make those kind of things happen, why don't we shift them to looking at other things and other forms of energy? And I'll, I'll come back to that in one of my, my other points. Um, so the second area that I mentioned that, you know, role of a, a company like ours going forward is efficiency and reduced emissions from our own operations. So this is sort of, this is sort of interesting to tell from an, an individual company reputation standpoint. I'm not confused that it doesn't actually make a big difference in the whole system of the world. So, and, and I think it's important to separate those two components. But in 1997, we set a target along with a number of countries around the world that said by the year 2010, we'd reduce our emissions, CO2 emissions, by 5% relative to what they were in 1990. And in 2009, they were 35 percent below what they were in 1990. So it, you know, it is it, it is a demonstration that that kind of focus can lead to re results. Now, I fully recognize that our bigger impact on the total system is in the the energy and the fuels we supply, not what we do in our own facilities. But doing it well in our own facilities is effectively a just a core part of of staying in business. Um, the third area is investing in, in low carbon fuels and technologies. So I already mentioned the mitigation side, CCS being the example that I used for power generation in larger facilities. And of course we have a lot of subsurface expertise that we can bring to the, uh, to the table for that discussion. When it comes to low carbon energies, there's really two areas that we focus on in a big way. And the first of those is an increasing focus on natural gas. And the second is well, what I'd call sustainable biofuels. So natural gas first. I think it's, it's interesting, Dad's, Dan said it a minute ago, my title is the president of Shell Oil Company. 
And the fact is that in 2012, Shell will make a lot more natural gas. Well, not a lot. More than 50% of its production will be natural gas. Um, and, and that number will continue to increase as we go forward. So oil production on a percentage basis will come down. Our natural gas uh, will continue to increase. And of course, we, we do that by choice. Huh? That's, a, that's a strategic choice that we make. And it, it recognizes this strong belief that natural gas is probably the quickest and least expensive route to lower emissions, which means it's going to be in demand. That's what government, society, and others are going to demand from us. So, you, you, and you know, the, you know the story around natural gas, I'm sure. So, relative to coal-fired power generation, half the CO2, you know, modern coal versus, uh, versus modern gas-fired power, um, better, complementary, comp more complementary, if you will, with, with solar and wind as intermittent sources and, uh, and so forth. So a lot of, uh, lot of issues that, that push it that direction. Now, it's also, I think, important because we see an increasing link to electric mobility as accounting for as much as maybe 40% of the passenger miles driven by the middle of this century as well. So I don't plan to go off on that tangent, but I wanted to let you know it was in our thinking as well. Uh, but there always seems to be a, a caveat, and particularly around this, this vehicle's miles traveled and so much of that being supplied by electricity. And that is that if you do the same sort of projections, again, pretty big error bar around it, but it looks like there could be as many as twice as many vehicles in the world by the middle of the century as there are today. So two, two billion vehicles by 2050. Obviously creates its own challenges. So, the other area that we, that we focus on, other than increasing our share of natural gas, which would be the preferred fuel, is we work on, on sustainable biofuels. Um, we work a lot on what I'd call second generation biofuels. So the new technology is to turn waste material, straw, what have you, into a usable fuel. And what I would tell you today is the gap between now and commercialization of those is probably at least five years away and it could be longer not the fastest process in the world. And so in the meantime, what we've decided to do is we've taken a strategic decision to focus on today's biofuels, what's, cap what's possible with today's um, technology, and combine that with our research around second generation biofuels. And so what that, the result of that is, our, our proposal that we've just recently announced, which is a $12 billion joint venture with COSAN, who's the largest sugarcane based ethanol producer in Brazil. Now, the reason why we've gone that route is, first of all, it's, it's a profitable business as it stands today. And from a full life cycle, well to wheel sort of comparison, the, uh, this, this sugarcane based ethanol is 90% lower CO2 emissions than the same thing with oil. So it is quite a, quite a gain on the CO2 side. So what, what, what we'll do is now in, in, in or put in the capital to grow that business and now put in our new technology to try to use that base operation, which is already at scale, which already has the infrastructure associated with it, and try to advance then the second generation biofuels using that system as a, uh, as a base. I think the only, uh, the only thing we're into in a, in a somewhat significant way that I haven't mentioned so far is the wind business. I don't make a big deal out of it because it's not a huge business for us, but we've built, over, built up about a gigawatt of wind power generation in the portfolio. We continue to build that portfolio. Even though it's not very adjacent to our business, it doesn't necessarily match the skills that we have in the oil and gas business, we found that we're pretty good at it. And so we'll probably continue to, uh, to develop down that road in a, uh, in a relatively moderate sense. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here in just a second. I just wanted to make a couple of comments about the legislation that I'm not coming here to talk about today. And, the, uh, and that is that, you know, I, I think I said it at the beginning, but I am still optimistic that this is going to happen. I think the, uh, if I, as I think about all of this in terms of what's really possible in the, in the political environment that we're in, I think this comes very, very close. It's a very comprehensive package. It has cap and trade at its base, which, uh, which we think is the right way to go. It, it takes a look at the broad suite of energies and recognizes the role of both conventional energies and alternative energies. It allows for the kind of transition time that's needed for businesses to adjust, so it starts to remove the, the loss of American jobs and competitiveness. 
kind of issues. It recognizes the role of natural gas in making real emissions reductions in the, uh, in the relative near term. And of course, it goes much broader than the energy piece. That was just the, uh, the specific energy elements that I thought I would mention. So it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's very good, and I hope we have an opportunity to, uh, to get started with that sooner rather than later. So I'm gonna stop there and, and hope we can just go to questions. Thank you, Marvin. We actually have uh, plenty of time for questions, and there's two microphones here. If you could line up behind uh, each of them, and we'll go back and forth. Um, I have a couple of uh, uh, comments for anybody who does have a question. Please keep it a question. Keep it short. Remember, uh, uh, this is not a place for, uh, for speeches. This is uh, the idea is to, to hear from Marvin. I, let, let me ask the first yeah, question, Marvin. Please. So, so we had a discussion about this earlier, but I'd love you to sort of comment more publicly about this. Uh, south of our border, Mexico is in real trouble in terms of their oil production. They've yeah. been a, a major oil uh, producing country for a long time, and yet they're going to be a net importer in the next few years. Yeah. And economically, that's really big trouble for the U.S. as well because of the, you know, I, I, the, the crime issue that is beginning to cross the border in yeah. Arizona and even in Texas. Um, uh, what do you think the time scale for developing Mexico's deep water resources would be? And, and do you think Mexico has a chance to pull itself out and become an oil producing country again? Or do you think they'll be able to keep up some production and s but, but will ultimately rely on importing oil, which will dramatically change their economy? Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's, a, I mean, it's a, it really is a critical point for the U.S. But if I just myself in Mexico for a while and put yourself in the role of the, of the government there, Oil and gas development, Pemex revenues off of Pemex supply 60% of the social services that, that take place in Mexico. I mean, it is, it is basically the economy. So when you think of all that revenue going to all those services to supply the entire country and to, within a short number of years going to an import position where you're, where you're having to pay for it rather than get 60% of your revenue from it, it would be a totally devastating situation. Now, you know, the, the concern would be, have, have they are actually already waited too long because they have very rapidly declining um, production right now. I think it's well recognized by the government. That's why we've taken a politically distasteful conversation about having any foreign investment in energy in Mexico now to a pretty, you know, pretty prominent topic on the, uh, on the political scene. The big question is how quick can it happen? And so as you talk about deep water resources, this is a multi-year process, so you know, there's not a lot known about the deep water in Mexico. You can look at, at relative geologic systems from the part of the Gulf of Mexico we're very familiar with, and you, you, sh you can say, yes, there should be oil and gas in these areas. We know we have the technology to do it. But the, the seismic process, the exploration drilling process, the building of a facility, and the initiation of production could easily be eight to ten years for these folks. And, and they could be looking at an import situation unless something magical happens in five or six years, I would imagine. So pretty, de and, and you know, I won't try to explain it, but you can imagine the impact that could have on the U.S. Oh, yeah. as, a, as a partner in a neighboring country. Absolutely. Let's start over here. You could please state your name and mm -hmm. your affiliation and uh, then ask your question. Hi, I'm Dan Recht. I'm a graduate student in the engineering school here. And you spoke about having biofuels produce liquid fuels uh, from, as a shell product in the future, but demand for liquid fuels, I suspect, is going to be much higher than just biofuels can supply. Is there a role in Shell's portfolio for the conversion of natural gas or coal into liquid fuels? And can you describe that? Yeah, it's a, as a matter of fact, we'll, in early 2011, we'll start up a, a very large project, largest in the world, gas to liquids project. So this will be in Qatar, um, very large gas field there without a real immediate gas market. And so we've developed the technology. We're now finishing up the investment of the 18 to 19 billion dollars it takes to build a facility like this, just one facility. Um, and that will start producing liquids here in the, in the relatively, you know, sometime in the next year, most likely. The, uh, so it's, it's economical. We could do it. It's good. I mean, part of it is because we get the gas at a very low price, of course, with the, with the uh, being in partnership with, with the country and the resource holder. It's a, it's a good product in that it's, it's cleaner 
burning, meaning it's not necessarily a CO2 saver so much as it is if you think about all the other pollutants and emissions associated with burning liquid fuels, it's much lower, much better in terms of the other components, probably about neutral on the CO2 side. Um, this is one of those projects I was talking about earlier that as it's been designed and built, it's fitted for CO2 capture and sequestration. So if, if in partnership with the government in the future the decision was made to capture it and store that CO2, that would be, that would be an option. So my, you know, the summary of my points would be technically it, it, it could be done. We've been doing it for quite a while at a smaller scale. We've now gone to a very large commercial scale up. It'll start operating next year. How well that runs, how well we find the, you know, the receptive, receptivity of consumers for that product, which I expect to be very high, will then inform when will we do the next one. Yeah. Hello, my name is Achim. I'm with the Harvard Center for Astrophysics. Um, I was interested here uh, about the Quest program, about the tar sands uh, in Alberta. I mean, right now, the the tar sands, they, they take a lot of energy to produce, and of course it's not the most environmentally friendly mm. uh, way of getting oil, and they're probably economic only in, with triple digit oil prices. So if you add carbon capture and sequestration, which in itself costs energy, the economics will probably be high triple digit oil prices. Does that mean that, that Shell expects that high triple digit oil prices are with us uh, for the future? If you yeah, could so comment I, on that, that would be okay. nice. Thanks, thanks for your question. I, so I have to go back and, and adjust my, my perception of some of those assumptions you make going in because I, I see them differently. So we, the, the oil sands for us is in two packages. There's a, about 155,000 barrels a day producing today. They call that the base project, and we're going through a 100,000 barrel a day expansion. So it's you know a quarter of a million barrels a day is a very large project. The first 155,000 of that actually paid out in about five years. We got our investment back in about five years. So you're right that this is some of the highest cost oil that's commercially produced on, on the planet, but it's not prohibitively high. So that's when you, you look to understand you know, people's mindset around why are they pursuing these sort of resources, particularly with the kind of oil prices we've seen in the last 18 months and, and who knows where it goes from here. Part of the rationale is that the business is better than, than what you described. If you start a project today where the cost of development is higher, particularly as the economy improves, then construction capacity and other things will make the cost go higher. It's still, the one we're building right now is still a good business at about 75, 70 to $75 a barrel. So just fix that piece. The CCS piece, the carbon capture and storage piece, you are right on the mark. So, you know, the, the government putting in $800 million will have to put in quite a bit of money to make a full project. That billion dollars wouldn't get spent um, under normal commercial circumstances. And so this is a, this is a force fit, publicly funded demonstration project that it can be done. And to help answer the question, what kind of steps can be taken to bring the cost down over time? But it wouldn't happen on its own for, uh, for commercial reasons. Even with a price on carbon, you know, this, a CCS project right now is, you know, Dan's going to have better numbers than I am, but it's surely over $100 a ton, I would think, about $100 a ton, depending on where you are. And, the, and that's, a, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty high price. Thanks. Hi there. Over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> My name is Michael Graham. I'm an undergraduate at the college. Um, and I was just wondering, earlier in your talk, you mentioned that there's a very high inertia and cost barrier to um, creating new power generating plants. Um, and I was curious, what uh, future do you see in the decentralized model of um, power generation where homeowners or power consumers would generate their own power? And if you do see a future in that, what is Shell's future in that? I don't know that, you know, we've looked at, to a degree, distributed power generation before. It's, so it's not doesn't fall in our top 10, I could say. You know, there's not a lot of conversation about it inside of Shell, to be perfectly frank. Um, I'm sure that, you know, Dan may want to comment on this. There's probably people in here that know a lot more about the current economic state of that than I do. It hasn't crossed the barrier to become really interesting for us yet. So our focus, and, and part of this is because the, the opportunity set is so big, our focus is really around, you know, lar larger scale, natural gas-fired power generation 
um, because a lot of that capacity is basically sitting there now and, and empty and, and could be used to generate uh, power and because it, you know, it looks on virtually every parameter that we see with the exception of maybe very low coal prices looks better than coal. But if you start to apply car price to carbon, then that's going to shift. So that, that's enough and big enough to keep us focused on supplying that gas in the meantime. Anything you'd add on the, the smaller scale distribution? No, except that 60 minutes piece was certainly uh, yeah. intriguing, but who knows if it's real. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a little, you intimidated the audience a little bit. No. Let, me, let me ask you about that oil spill um, uh, that's developing now. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not yet clear how bad it's going to be, right? We don't yet know whether it's going to be fixable. Yeah. Um, how do you think the politics of that oil spill are likely to affect expansion of drilling offshore, even now that Obama has expanded the opportunities yeah. for offshore? Well, I mean, I'd, you'd probably understand when I say I'm concerned about it. I mean, it is a it is a real tragedy that it's happened. As somebody who's in the business, we drill a lot of deep water wells. I will tell you that there's so many redundant systems to keep something like this from happening that I don't understand what's happened yet. And so this, you know, to, to get the real story on the situation in the Gulf is going to take an investigation to find out what really happened. Um, it's very clear to me what they're doing now to try to fix it and mitigate it. And, you know, we, we have those same mitigations in, uh, in place for ourselves and the, the industry does, is in fact, together. Um, on the, on the, so there's more story yet to be written there, and, and you know I could I could speculate, but it wouldn't help you if I just speculate on you know what could have possibly gone wrong to, to create that kind of situation. Um, you know I, I have to say that you know I was appreciative of the Obama administration and the president when he came out a couple of weeks ago and said you know strategically for the country it's going to make sense to open some of these areas up and avail ourselves to more of our own resources, and there's a jobs angle to that, there's a deficit angle to that, there's a security angle to that and otherwise, and it's based on the belief that we can do it safely. Now, I also appreciate the fact that he's come out since then and said, this doesn't change the way I view that decision and where I think we're going. But, and I say I appreciate it because I'm sure that's difficult when you're sitting there looking at a, at a blowout in the Gulf of Mexico putting oil in the water, and I have the same difficulty with it. Uh, I think, you know, where it goes from here will, to a degree, I have to suspect, will depend on how quickly we get that situation resolved and how quickly we can understand and explain why it happened sure. to begin with. But uh, I hope we, we continue with the bigger picture. Um, hello, my name is Niall Henderson. I'm uh, at MIT, a graduate student there. Um, I was just uh, interested in the recent bid uh, license around in Iraq. Uh, the oil companies came away with very low margin deals, you know, $1.50 to $2 a barrel uh, deals, almost like technical service agreements. Uh, and coupled with the increasing uh, resource nationalism and the strength of the national oil companies and the fact that companies like Shell are being pushed to the very high cost, uh, you know, basins in the world. <coughs> I just wonder if you're, do you, are you worried at all about the long term sustainability of the business model of the upstream oil and gas, the independent oil and gas companies? Well, I think you'd be, I'd, if I see if I can start this answer the right way, I think you'd be a fool not to be worried about it. So, so yes, I mean, as a, as a competitive business, those are the kind of things, just as you described, that we watch out for all the time. What's the viability of the strategy in the business? I think that, that the push that, that we have is, in particular as a technology company, is that our route to success in working with the NOCs as partners and work, we're, partners with national oil companies all over the world um, is do we bring something to the table and our assumption as a company is if we don't then we're not going to be invited to be there and so having the latest technology having ways to do it that are less expensive that are better environmentally those are the kind of things that get us in the door and bring us those partnerships so am I concerned about it yes is it our strategy to continue to stay ahead of that wave it is and I'll tell you that it's been successful we have, uh, we've been significantly expanding our business and opportunities in China, which is, a, a, I think, one example of that. Um, it, well, actually, there's, there's examples everywhere. But you've got to bring something to the table, otherwise you're not a viable piece. Uh, hi there, my name is Will Herber. I'm a graduate student at MIT as well. <coughs> um, you mentioned briefly uh, drilling for oil and gas in the Arctic Circle, yeah. and uh, some of that lies in Russia. And I've been interested recently because there's been some political tensions between uh, oil companies, foreign oil companies in the Russian Federation and the government there. Um, maybe 
I just pre appreciate some comments of yours in that in that area. And what are your thoughts on going future in in uh, drilling in the Russian Arctic Circle? The, uh, the, if I start with the latter part of the question, I mean, there is first of all, there's a huge resource base there in the in the Russian Arctic. There's a there's a huge resource base around the entire Arctic, and I think most of the predictions I've seen are that about 25 percent of the world's oil and gas type resources are in, actually in the Arctic. Um, you know, we're very heavily in, involved in the Sakhalin 2 project. We built the project. We're partners with, uh, you know, with the companies in the, in the country there. And that, had, that project, I think, to your point, had its difficult moments. And that's not unusual, actually, for you know, whether we're operating in Russia or anywhere else. Uh, that was a particularly challenging one. It took several years to get through it. But we came to a negotiated agreement where, in the end, we ended up basically selling more of that project to the, to the Russians. Now, they control the project. We're still involved, but we're a minority partner now. In the end, we like that because we're aligned on where we want to go with it, and we were able to get the value we needed out of that, that reduction in ownership. So it, it worked out okay in the end. And, and I go through all that story just to say, that as, as Russia starts to push another couple of key, very large projects as priorities for the country, we're still interested in doing that kind of work. And it's, it's a little, back to, little bit back to the point of around the national oil companies. I mean, to a degree, while, while there's, we have access to more opportunities than we can afford to invest in as a company. And so we're continually high grading that list of opportunities. Um, but, but really big, really large, significant world-scale projects are, you know, they're not everywhere. They only exist certain places, and that's going to keep places like Russia very interesting. Hello, Travis Frank at the Fletcher School, Tufts University. Um, my question for you is about investment and f investment in future technologies. You mentioned a $40 carbon price, yeah. and that investment will be important moving into the future. So I was... I guess I was wondering how Shell evaluates projects, and if you could describe what sort of criteria go into things. And specifically, you chose to, to do second generation biofuels, while other companies such as ExxonMobil have chosen kind of to look towards algae and other technologies. And I was just wondering what criteria kind of drove you one direction versus another. Yeah, there's a, uh, so a couple of, couple of quick pieces to that. I mean, it, it, you would imagine we rank things both on pure economic terms and then more strategic angles, what can it lead to from that point? Not just a discrete project, but what can it lead to? What other opportunities, partnerships, et cetera? And that can be a relatively straightforward financial ranking based on our projections of oil and gas prices, or as you say, CO2 prices and, and other things. Now the, you know, the push into biofuels, while we found, and let me clarify what I said first of all, is. Our, our research and our path up until about a year ago had been all second generation algae type, you know, so straw, biomass, algae, you name it. We've got seven sort of technical joint ventures going to figure out which one of those is really going to work in a viable way. Where we got impatient with that is it's just too slow of a time scale. And that there, there is first generation viable biofuels now that could be done in a sustainable way, considering all the land issues and other, and other things, and might actually boost the second generation, which is why we've chosen to go take a step back, go into first generation now, to hopefully run the, the second generation quicker. So I think the, other than that step back and taking a very large material financial position in existing biofuels, the, uh, there's probably not a lot of difference then between the forward look from a, you know, you described Exxon and algae and what we're doing on the R&D side. Um, so, a lot of different aspects to this question, but you, you set an Aspired portfolio as a company, you rank economically, you decide where you're going to invest on, on some of the things I mentioned. What doesn't show up in that conversation is the fact that we have this underlying stream of research and development, again, you know, priding ourselves in being a technology company, which is looking at the broader suite of, of opportunities, you know, both improvements in those conventional energies but also you know, trying to find the things that people haven't thought of yet. And that's bench scale research. We do a lot of that. We don't talk a lot about that because it's, it's not very impactful yet. And uh, for example, we've got, I don't know now, five or six hydrogen refueling stations for automobiles in the US. Now in most cases where I say that, 
a lot of times it gets interpreted as sort of a greenwashing while you're doing hydrogen, but it doesn't actually make any difference. And that's right. It's not big enough to make any difference at all. But it is big enough for us to be in the business, to see how it works, to see what the issues are, and to help determine whether or not it's something that we could make something out of in the future. Uh, very quickly. Yeah. So, it, is there criteria such as, we, the, like a technology will have to have displaced 10% of, uh, of transport fuels or something like that? Do you have just kind of criteria about scale? Yeah, I mean, it always translates into something like that initially, but to be perfectly honest with you, the, the decisions usually made further upstream from that, meaning can it have a certain percentage hurdle impact on the company? So even if it's not the total system, you know, if it's enough to move Shell by 10%, then it starts to get really interesting. Yeah. Hi, my name is Reed Capolino. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Uh, I was fascinated by your comment that the operating cost of a CCS project uh, would likely deter, you know, private industry interest, even if government were to pay the entire upfront capital cost. Yeah. So can you, can you elaborate on that? Um, particularly in the context uh, of what I understand to be, you know, the cross-industry collaboration challenge of CCS, you know, getting together subsurface, electric utility, and chemicals industry, um, which seems to me that the, the subsurface industry really, they, you all are very good and embrace taking on risk, whereas the utility industry, I mean, at least in the regulated market, almost by definition, they avoid risk. So how? You know, if there's operating cost, if the cost is that much of an issue, what hope is, the, you know, what is the way forward for getting this cross-industry collaboration? I think there, there's probably several ways you can answer that question, but I think the, you know, the, the base level answer is business likes a, a level playing field to a degree. So it's sort of the, the rules of the game, they like a level playing field. So if I think about this CCS project in, in Canada that's attached to our oil sands project, so the government spends $800 million, puts it in place, and over the next couple of years, it'll cost me several hundred million dollars to run it. Now, it's a very competitive business. Huh? And so, you know, without some incentive, meaning a price on carbon or some other incentive, why would a business sitting here spend that three or $400 million when the right one right next to it wouldn't and would put all that money back to its shareholders? And that's where the, that's where the conflict really comes into play, and that's why I made the statement I did. Whereas if there was a price on carbon to provide an incentive to operate and capture that CO2, you've, sh you've shifted that playing field, if you will, and you start to get then the industry participating in those kind of activities. Okay. Uh, hi, um, I'm Julian. I'm an undergraduate here at the college. Um, you, <coughs> you mentioned um, that you were looking at first generation biofuels um, and specifically sugarcane. I was wondering if you could comment on the relevance of that domestically or if that was more an international thing and if you were looking into um, things like cellulosic technology with switchgrass or anything yeah. along those lines. Okay, thanks. Now on the, uh, on the first generation sugarcane piece, it's, it's right now a domestic Brazilian issue because it's a big scale as well. They're, they're the largest producer down there, and that's one of the largest producing countries in the world. The, uh, but they absorb all of that capacity within the country right now. Something that Shell brings to the table, being the, the global traders that we are as well, is we'll likely open up some new markets to give the, you know, the, our, us ourselves and our joint venture partners, a producer now, access to other markets, whether that's the US or Europe or others. So you might see some, of, that's an option to see some of that start to move. I think the relevance to the country is it's still a relatively young industry. It has a lot of expansion capability. So it could be a source of low carbon fuels for the U.S. Um, I do hear of some people, you know, talking about southern Louisiana as areas where, you know, you could potentially replicate some of that. Um, that's really not our focus right now. It's on, it's on demonstrating the, 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 the capability and bringing it up to a scale. We're focused now, but you could do, you certainly could do some production in the, in the U.S. Uh, hi, my name is David Dixon. I'm a master student at the <clears throat> at the Ed School. Now, you mentioned the uh, several hydrogen fueling stations yeah. that Shell has across the United States. Do you have any plans to put uh, any compressed natural gas refueling stations or LNG fueling stations? Um, there's no there's like no that? active plans as I speak today. I haven't allocated any money to do that, but it's a it is an interesting piece I think of the natural evolution of 
a very large secure supply of natural gas in the, in the country. So I, you know, I don't, I don't have a good prediction for you yet what degree of transportation will be captured by direct use of natural gas, but I do think it will be a portion. I have no doubt some, some pilot projects will be funded and, uh, and we'll just see how that takes off. But it's an area we're watching really closely. How much time do you spend with Moon Pickens? Yeah, so I run into him a lot. <laughs> he's, he's and he's, of course, pushing it very hard, yeah. 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 Please, last question. Hi there, my name's Toby Nussbaum. I'm at the Kennedy School. Um, you mentioned uh, the forecast of doubling energy needs by the middle of the century yeah. uh, with a suggestion that 30% of that could be provided by renewables. Um, I know that depends a lot on what the makeup of those, of those carbon fuels are, but that sounds like an increase in CO2 emissions, uh, certainly from levels right now, um, which is problematic for climate reasons and also uh, quite different from the political rhetoric. You know, we've heard the G8 uh, leaders this past year talk about, I think it was 80% reductions by 2050. We've heard different uh, targets of two, um, of two uh, Celsius for the maximum yeah. climate change or 450 or whatever your measure is. Right. You hear much more ambitious political targets about trying to c control the temperature. So mm. how do you match those ambitions with your assumptions about energy needs in the middle of the century, and um, do you think those ambitions are realistic? It's a, uh, so what it, it's an attempt. What we do is we put together what we call scenarios, you know, the scenarios of the future, and so what we do is we try to, we try to define what some of the options are and, and what the direction we're on right now, where it takes us and where some of the alternatives would be. So, you know, this projection, it's the interesting part about the discussion, I think, because this projection of 30% of that through alternatives in 2050 would be the assen essentially the equivalent of 60% today being supplied by renewables. So you can see what a leap it is to think about getting there over, you know, what are, are very few short decades. Um, so it just highlights the, the challenge, the realistic challenge that's out there. It's why, you know, we as a, as a company and why we, you know, when I go out and advocate for certain things, I talk about the let's be realistic about what production is going to take place over the next several decades and work not only new technologies for new industries but also mitigation technologies for co2 emissions from conventional energies so i think that's critical but it also then so it, it's not an attempt to solve that problem it just highlights that there is a real issue there and you know i started this at 550 and then was convinced it was no it's 450 and then no it's got to be 350 and so I don't know how to solve that, that problem. But I do know getting started down that road, thinking about the use of natural gas, which can cut some of that in half early on, are the important steps that need to happen now while we continue to work techn te technology angles and other things to, to help with that future picture. Yeah. So let's please join me in thanking Marvin for his very candid <laughs> session. Yeah. 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 And uh, let me remind you, this whole series has been sponsored by the Bank of America, and we appreciate their support. Next year's program will be announced sometime over the summer. So go to environment.harvard.edu or energy.harvard.edu, and you will see uh, the speakers when they're announced. Thanks so much.